Hello, fellow creepsters. It's your girl, Amrit, in Salt Lake City, Utah. You're listening to another Sinister Sightings episode on a Paranormal Chicks. So sit back, get cozy, maybe turn the lights off. Try not to get scared, but if you do, it's okay. I usually get scared, too. Hey, y'all, I'm Donna. And I'm Carrie. And we are Paranormal Chicks. Sinister Sightings, 89. And you just heard Amrit. Or as Carrie likes to say, Amrit. After she told me it rhymes with omelet. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, cool, Amrit. And I sat there like I normally do after Carrie says something, and I'm thinking, that doesn't sound right. (laughs) Mm -mm. That does not sound right. (laughs) I mean, my strengths in life. Not rhyming and not state abbreviations. Give me muscles, give me bones. Don't give me abbreviations and rhyming. Good one. (laughs) Well, I thought it rhymed. (laughs) Don't give her a catchphrase either. (laughs) Thank you so much, Jacqueline, for donating your intro to Omrit. And if you want to intro a Sinister Sightings episode like Omrit, head on over to patreon.com slash the APC podcast. This one is called Bringing Light to My Best Friend's Murder. Hey ladies, love you, love the podcast, let's get right to it. I have to warn you though, the story is pretty long because it covers the span of a couple of years leading to her death, but stick with me, but it's all relevant to understand what happened and why it's so important to bring light to her story. Before we jump in, I have to give you some background so you better understand the context of Lily's story. Lily and I met in college. I was a sophomore, she was a freshman. We met at a meeting I arranged for our campus's chapter of Oxfam International. Awesome organization. Check them out. And we're friends right from the start. Fast forward a few years, I've graduated and moved out to Cincinnati, and Lily is still in school. She got an off-campus apartment and was living by herself, and this is where our story starts. Lily started dating this guy who we'll call Jake. I could tell from the start it was bad news. She was very elusive about him and wouldn't introduce him to any of her friends or family. I was concerned, but I also knew that Lily's relationships were often fleeting and that he was probably just one of the newest flavors of the week. Right around this time, two things happened. Lily stopped answering my calls and texts, and I finally saw a picture of Jake. As soon as I saw this picture... I freaked out, and I knew immediately that I had to find Lily because I took one look at Jake's face, and I knew that he was addicted to heroin. I started blowing up Lily's phone. I called. I sent multiple texts. I called some more, and I left a very heated voicemail telling her to call me back in five minutes or I would be leaving my house immediately and coming to campus to hunt her down and wouldn't leave until I found her. No sooner than I left that voicemail, my phone rang, but it wasn't Lily. It was her mom calling me to tell me that she had Lily's phone and was screening her calls and messages and had just listened to my voicemail. So why was her mom screening her phone? Because my worst fear had been confirmed. Lily was addicted to heroin. By this point, her parents had found out as well and intervened. They pulled Lily from school and sent her to a rehab facility. I was the only person outside of her immediate family who was allowed to have contact with her and correspond with her regularly. I still have all the letters she wrote me while she was there. Not only did Lily overcome her addiction, she absolutely flourished. Despite Jake's repeated attempts to maintain his hold on her, including a message of, If I can't have you, no one can. All contact with Jake was ceased. She graduated from the program and she went back to school and graduated with honors. I made a special trip back to campus to watch her walk across that stage on the day of her college graduation. And I have never been more proud of anyone in my life. 
After college, Lily went to the University of Miami for a dual master's PhD program in sociology. She loved it. She loved everything about Miami. She was living her dream and kicking serious ass. Then, in December of 2014, just before the end of her first semester at U of M and two weeks before Christmas, she came to visit me for a weekend and to attend a mutual friend's grad school graduation. We spent the weekend talking, eating, laughing, and just enjoying hanging out since we rarely got to see each other since she had moved to Florida. When I dropped her off at the airport on Sunday to go back to Miami, we hugged and we parted ways saying we would see each other again at Christmas when she came home for what part of winter break she could so I could finally introduce her to my boyfriend, now husband. That was the last time I saw Lily alive. The morning of Christmas Eve 2014, I was awoken by my phone ringing. It was Lily's mom. I answered, thinking it was a little weird she was calling me so early. In that moment, my life changed forever. She was sobbing. Through the sobs came the words, She's gone. Lily's gone. My best friend was dead. And I knew Jake had something to do with it. And he did. Lily got home for Christmas just a couple of days before her death. On the night she died, she borrowed her sister's car, saying she was going to hang out with some friends. That friend turned out to be Jake. For reasons we still do not know, the two of them had been in contact again, and she made plans to meet him that night. The plan was to do some H, according to the message Jake had sent her, saying he had gotten some for them. What happened after she got there that night is something else we will never know. But we do know that she went to see Jake with the intent of doing heroin. According to Jake, they watched a movie when she got there and were hanging out for a while before anything happened. But in later versions of his story, she had only been there for about 20 minutes before she took the heroin and it became clear that she was overdosing. But by the time the 911 call was made and the ambulance arrived, it was clear that she had been there for far longer than 20 minutes. When the paramedics arrived on the scene, Lily's skin was blue because she had been without oxygen for so long. She was rushed to the hospital where she held on for another hour or so, but passed away in the early morning hours of Christmas Eve. I won't recount all the details of Jake's story, but I will say that there were cannonball-sized holes in it from the beginning that made it very clear to investigators that he was not being honest. To this day, we still do not know exactly what happened that night, but we do know based on the toxicology reports that Lily did not die from a heroin overdose. Lily was killed by a lethal dose of fentanyl that had been injected into her body. There was never any heroin. Jake had intentionally gotten fentanyl and let her think it was heroin. Whether or not it was him who gave it to her, he knew what she was taking. He knew what it would do to her. He knew he was killing her. He let her die. He sat there and watched and waited until he knew it was too late before he called 911. Jake murdered my best friend. And he did not get away with it. I was present in the courtroom the day he was sentenced for his part in Lily's death. Because there is no way to prove if he was the one who injected her, he was not able to be charged with murder. But he was sentenced to 14 years and will not be eligible for parole until at least 11 of those years have been served. Since Lily's death, her mom has been advocating for awareness about the dangers of fentanyl. She has been instrumental in helping get legislation passed that provides harsher sentencing to heroin dealers and how overdose deaths are investigated. None of this will ever bring Lily back, but her death has been a catalyst in drug reform, at least in our small corner of the world. Until next time, creep it real, fuck fentanyl, and fuck Jake. Tanya. Holy hell. Wow. What a bastard. There's so many whys of that story that I can't, I mean, I can't begin to even understand how you process, but I'm with you. Fuck Jake. And I'm so glad he got punished. Yeah. And fentanyl is no joke. No. I just don't. And I don't mean this in like a, this is going to sound so elitist and I truly don't mean it this way, but I really 
don't understand drugs. I, I don't, I'm thankful that I don't understand it. And I, I and I, I've been around it. Like I know people who have been in situations like Lily. You know, I'm not, it's not like I've never had anyone in my life that has gone through something like that. And so it's like, obviously no one ever as close as you with it being your best friend. But I just, God, it just makes my stomach hurt hearing that story. Just from the start, just as soon as you said he was on heroin, I was like, oh God, like my, it, reading that, my stomach hurts the whole time. I don't know. That's heartbreaking. I know. I don't even know what to say. No, but I mean, at least something good and positive came out of something tragic like that. That's like the only silver lining in that. Moving on before we get all emotional up in here. Hey, ladies, first and foremost, I want to thank you for my welcome to the Creepinati video. I love the fact that you take the time to personally thank your Patreon members. I listen to a ton of podcasts and haven't really been moved to contribute until I started listening to you. Your authenticity and connection to your people is what all podcasters should aspire to achieve. Oh, Oh my gosh. Thank you. Now for my story. My father was an amazing, albeit a pain in the ass, man. He was kind and would do anything for his family. This was especially true when he indulged my mother and I in our paranormal belief. We lived in Phoenix, Arizona, so he took us to the haunted house in Prescott and laughed when we swore we heard the doorknob jiggle. One year, my wife and I bought him sage because he thought it was ridiculous when on a haunting, that TV show, their solution to every problem was to burn the sage. In their retirement, they purchased a manufactured home from some longtime friends after one of them passed away. My mom insisted that their friend Dick, his name, not his personality, that his spirit was in that house. One day when I was visiting, my mom and I were sitting in the living room when the lamp started flickering on and off. We didn't think anything of it at first, but it kept happening. We asked if anyone was in the room and the light went on and off again. We were still skeptical, so we asked if anyone is here, turn off the light and boom, off it went. Now we're starting to believe. We asked, Dick, if that's you, turn the light on. And just like that, went on again. Now, my mom and I are having a holy shit moment and turned to call my dad so he could see this whole thing happening. I turned toward the kitchen and I could see him sitting at the table <laughs> laughing so hard he was crying with the remote control for the lamp in his freaking hand. <laughs> When he pulled himself together, all he could say between belly laughs was, you guys are so stupid. (laughs) This is just one of the many things my father did to keep us entertained. He passed away this past December, and I miss him every second of every day. Love you guys and creep it real, Julie. So when she sent this in, she sent it in through the website, and Mm -hmm. she had to send in twice, and... She was like, I don't know why it sent before I was finished. I don't think he wanted to send it in or, you know, yeah. like something. And it was like so funny because that would be her dad. Yes. Like, I'm going to fuck with her. Yes. Oh, God. That is a great story. I legit could see that happening to me and you and like anyone else. You know who I could see doing that? Colby's Colby. Dad. Colby oh. and his dad because they're the same fucking person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I wouldn't have been able to not laugh. Like, right? Like, the very first, okay, cool, cool, cool. But when they're like, Dick, if this is you, like, I would have lost it. I would have fucking <laughs> lost it. Also, I wonder what name, like, now is eventually going to be like, ew, you know? Oh, like, Richard is Dick? Yes. Like, who came up with that name? I know. And why is that now what a dick is called? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. I've started listening to podcasts and y'all are the first and only people I've listened to. I love listening to y'all, but I've got some stories. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, born and raised here. The house I grew up in was creepy. 
not just the get a bad feeling creepy ever so often, but shit happened so often, I thought I was literally going crazy. I've got lots of stories, but there is no way I could ever cover it all in one sitting. So to start it off, I just got done listening to y'all's shadow person episode that brought up a lot of memories. My upbringing was chaotic. Abusive father, constant fights, CPS, cops, etc. I'm only mentioning it because I know that people who have had lots of stress and whatnot are vulnerable in a way. Anyway, I used to always see things out of the corner of my eyes, but I've also seen shadow figures straight on. These occurrences used to mostly happen at night, but they would happen during the day too upstairs. Only I lived in the upstairs of the house. I would be scared to go to sleep and be in the dark and for it to be too quiet because it'd make my imagination go wild, but there's a difference between real and fake, and most of what I experienced felt as real as you and I. I had a slam 10 by 10 bedroom, so I'm not straining my eyes to see things. I'd constantly wake up and see a tall black figure in the corner of my bedroom. Sometimes it would stay and sometimes it would vanish. This would freak me out so badly. Then, very rarely, but seemed like too often, there would be this very tall figure in my doorway, like dead center of it, and just stand there. I felt like I was always being watched at night, and even during the day or when I was alone. I'd even seen the hat man in my room where the blob was sometimes. I've cried so many times from it being so scary. My parents would try to help me cope with it, my dad not so much because he didn't understand, but my mom was in the same boat as me and saw things too, but would never talk to me about it, I guess not to freak me out more. But we wound up putting up a wind chime outside of my bedroom window because, as y'all said, they don't like loud noises. That did seem to help out some, but not as much as I hoped. I wound up taking it down because it got too loud for me too, and things started to turn sour again. It's been about a year since I've seen a shadow person. The last time I saw one, I was icing a cake at my boyfriend's mother's place where we lived at the time. I hear something and I look up directly into the living room and I see a person slash figure walking and mid walk vanishes. It was like solid black. Its feet and hands were pointed as well. It didn't even look at me. It was like it had some place to be. It vanished so fast, but there was literally no denying what I had seen. I'm in a good place now, but all of this did happen when I was younger. Granted, I'm only 20, but you know what I mean, right? If y'all would like to hear about other experiences, just let me know and I can share more stories. And that was sent from the website, so I'm not sure if they wanted their name shared or not. Of course we want to hear all the stories. Yes, right? Send them in. I don't even want to see anything. First of all, how did you even know that they don't like loud noises? Uh, She listened to our episode. No, that was years ago. Huh? That was years ago. Oh. She said, as y'all said, but I get it now. You didn't teach her anything. (laughs) I just confirmed. Never mind. Good try. Bye. (laughs) (laughs) Allegedly a girl. We don't know. (laughs) True. I honestly don't. Moving on, since I was wrong. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Hello to my favorite ladies of the podcast world. I, like yourselves, have always had a love and morbid fascination with all things true crime and paranormal related. Even as a small child, I was a loyal watcher of the original Unsolved Mysteries and read my first Stephen King novel when I was eight. And bless my parents' heart, Most may have discouraged their child's interest in weird and disturbing things, hoping that they would do more normal things, but not mine. They saw my interest and let my little weird wings flap away. Fast forward to 2004 when I began nursing school. I had started working in the first of two nursing homes, caring primarily for elderly patients with dementia and Alzheimer's. I can tell you it's a hard and at times difficult job. But being a daughter of a U.S. Marine, I'm a tough chick that has nerves of steel and a stomach to match. So the issues of the job's physical demands and dealing with bodily fluids and the subsequent cleanup of said messes didn't faze me at all. Never has, never will. 
The job itself was rewarding to be able to care for these folks when no one else could and gave me a great deal of knowledge for when I did become a registered nurse and a great appreciation for the work my techs do. However, until I began working in the nursing field, I had no idea just how many strange tales and incidences can occur involving the paranormal. I heard many stories over the years from friends and coworkers, particularly the ones who work the night shifts. There are some very unusual things that you see and hear working nights in a nursing home or hospital, but I'll write about those another time. The first paranormal encounter I personally had made me a firm believer in the idea that some people just like to keep up their routine even after they're gone. I was working weekends and going to school Monday through Friday. It was on a Tuesday that I had learned a resident of mine, I'll call her Eleanor, had passed away from a massive heart attack on the unit where I worked. She was a sweet little lady and I was so sad to hear of her passing, like many of my residents over the years. So fast forward to the following Saturday when I was at work and I went to Eleanor's room to get her roommate, I'll call her Gertie, I love that name, (laughs) up and dressed for lunch. I helped Gertie into her wheelchair and took her to the sink in their room to brush her hair and wash her hands. The bathroom that they shared was in a separate small room next to the sink with its own door and light above it. Now I would help Eleanor into the bathroom, shut the door to give her privacy because I don't know a single person that likes having an audience while watering your flowers or dropping a deuce, even when it's my baby or my basset hounds. And when she was ready for me to help her out, she would knock three times on the inside of the door. So as I'm helping Gertie with her hair and about to wheel her out of the room, I hear three knocks from the inside of the bathroom. I stop thinking that's odd considering no one was in there. So I go to look. The light was on, but no one was there. I turn the light off, shut the door, and proceed out of the room with Gertie. Then I hear three knocks again. Now, the hair on the back of my neck is standing on end, but I wasn't totally terrified. I walk over and reluctantly open the door to find the light on, even after I know I turned it off. I stand there, pondering this odd occurrence for a few seconds, turn off the light, and close the door again. And again, as I'm heading out of the room, I hear three knocks from inside of the bathroom. And this time, the door was open just an inch or so that I can see the light was on again. Then it occurs to me, it must be Eleanor. So I talked with her like I always did and said, Hi, Eleanor. It's fine if you want the light on. I'll leave it that way for you. So I quietly shut the door, took Gertie to the table for lunch, and never heard the knocking again. Thank you for taking the time to read my story. I love your podcast. It's helped me laugh through these last few rough months of COVID chaos, and I'm grateful to you both for it. Creep it real, you wonderful Mississippi Queens, Rebecca. (laughs) One of my friends named her dog Gertie, well, Gertrude, and she called her Gertie, and I fucking love that name ever since. It was like an (laughs) older poodle, and it just, well, it was a young poodle, but like by the time I knew it, it was older, and it just... It made sense. (laughs) I want all the stories like that. All the, I work in a hospital. I work in a nursing home. I work on an ambulance. I work in a morgue. I don't fucking care. I want those stories. Yeah, those would be good. They're my favorite. (laughs) I don't have any of those stories. Shit, you're too noisy for a ghost to make noise. True. They be trying to do three knocks. Hell, you knocking yourself through the wall, everything else. Gertie's wheelchair, you'd be like, sorry. True. Now, she's really good with a wheelchair, y'all. I mean, I would run into the wall. The wheelchair Mm -hmm. wouldn't. I would. Yeah. All right. The next one is, what in the Beelzebub is going on here? I know that people have a lot of different opinions on darker entities slash demons, but I personally believe in them and believe that not talking about them gives them more power. I know that's completely backwards to what most people say, but it's the way I've learned to take back my control. Being demon possessed has been a fear since I was a kid. Um, Why? Because you watched uh, Days of Our Lives and saw Marlena get possessed when you were a kid? <laughs> I must have heard about demons at church or a TV movie my sister was watching because we didn't have internet in 1990. Anyway, after watching The Exorcist, 
I don't think it was edited at 2 p.m. on Saturday, but okay, A&E, I was terrified. I remember staring into a mirror and kind of unfocused my eyes, and my face began to morph into different horrifying images in the mirror. I'm not convinced that was paranormal, as I have a very active imagination, but it was still scary to 12-year-old me. The most terrifying thing that happened to me was when I was showering. I used to have to hang a towel up on the shower door, or I felt like someone was watching me. Needless to say, my dumbass didn't secure the towel well enough, and it fell onto my shoulder, mid-shower. I'm surprised I didn't pass away right then and there, but my soul absolutely left my body. (laughs) (laughs) The more spooky, scary stuff happened when I was slowly getting more and more religious. I would have been in my early 20s, and I unfortunately can't remember all of the details because I definitely blocked a lot of it out. But I remember a few times where I stumbled over the Lord's Prayer, which I knew by heart. And there was another time where I heard voices screaming in my head. I don't have schizophrenia and have never had hallucinations. And that's definitely one of the scariest experiences that I've ever had. I found that the only thing that helped the fear and the voices go away was being firm and outright telling Satan to fuck off with his bullshit. I wrote another story about past lives and having the dark spirit attached to me. The medium assured me that once a dark entity is removed, they can't reattach to you. She then went on to say that you're likely to come into contact with many dark entities any given day who can attach to you instead. Thanks, Barbara. I feel so much better. My last experience with something dark is whatever followed me home from Hong Kong. I lived there for two years, 10 years ago. Two different mediums have asked, do you know you have something dark attached to you? I think it's from when you were overseas, but they didn't give me any other information. I truly have no idea how I could have picked up anything. I was very careful about being very respectful anytime I did visit or pass a temple, street temple. I didn't buy anything unusual or antique. And as far as I know, I didn't have anyone who would have wanted to have hurt me. But I truly have no idea. It's a mystery that I feel like will never be solved. And a part of me can't help but wonder if all of my health problems are because of whatever is attached to me. Is something dark actually attached to me? I have no idea. It seems like more than a coincidence that two mediums would mention it. Anyway, I know a lot of people don't like to talk openly about this kind of stuff because of the power it can bring. So I apologize if things get spooky after you read it. Love you gals and the podcast, Tawny. I'm glad you're the one who read that. You motherfucker. Both of yous. (laughs) (laughs) No, I can see both sides. Like, it's like... Don't say its name. You give it power. But also, like, you take away its power because you take away the mystery, you know? Yeah. Yep. So I can, I guess I can see both sides. For sure. I think the don't say its name, don't look into it, it's just so people don't go seeking it and not be educated. Mm-hmm. And you know what I mean? Like, and like, you know, do a Ouija board and not close it out or, you know, like yeah. whatever, like that stuff like that, that opens up should but then i just i'm with tawny speak your own truth whatever be a bad bitch all right this one is sleep paralysis and a sweet dream of course as everyone does i must tell you how much i love your podcast donna and carrie you two are the cutest gals ever and i love you so much that is all (laughs) good story (laughs) (laughs) all right now here's my first story Sleep paralysis, baby. I'm currently living near where I'm attending college. The house my roommates and I live in doesn't appear to be haunted, despite it being really old. I've lived here for two years. Therefore, when the show Haunting of Hill House came out, I binged it in my house. 10 out of 10 would recommend if you haven't seen it. I concur. In one of the scenes, which isn't a spoiler, one of the characters in the show, while laying in bed on their side, gets embraced by someone. When they turn that way to face the person who's embracing them, there's no one there. 
So one night when I went to bed, I quote unquote dreamed or quote unquote woke up to my room being the way that it is in real life. Nothing moved, everything in place. But as I turned one way on my side, I felt someone tightly embracing me. Uncomfortable, I turned on my back again. Doing this, I see a naked, pale blue person who has feminine features crawling from the end of my bed onto my body. This figure sits on me, pinning my arms down above my head. Where their eyes are supposed to be, they're black sockets. Where their lips are supposed to be, there's this wide open, pitch black mouth that seems to be screaming, yet I hear nothing coming out. Suddenly, I wake up. My room looks the same as it did in my quote unquote dream and how it did before I went to bed. I woke up panicking and on my back with my arms towards my head, just like the figure was pinning me. Thinking about this still makes me tear up, but don't worry. I staged my room later on that morning and nothing like that has happened since. Story number two, a sweet dream. My dad had a best friend with the name of Matt. We called him Uncle Matt because he truly was like an uncle to us. He had children of his own and an ex-wife, but sadly he wasn't close with them due to family complications. So he would come over for every holiday that he could and we would have a blast. Him and my dad would go deer hunting together and then we would eat the deer meat, though I still am not one to promote deer hunting, but to each their own. This happened until one spring, Uncle Matt had a heart attack and passed away. He had some health issues and have had multiple heart surgeries, so this wasn't a major surprise, but it still hurt our family, especially my dad. He had lost one of his friends, and he's not one to talk about his feelings, but I could see how upset he was. One night in the fall of that same year, I had a dream that I was with my parents in their kitchen. A phone rang, and I answered it, and it was Uncle Matt. He told me to tell my dad to go deer hunting and go eat a lot of food at this one lady's house. I was confused about the second part, but once that was said, the phone started to be fuzzy, and then I heard, I love you guys, and the phone was turned off, and I woke up. The next day, I called my dad and told him I had a dream about Uncle Matt. I told him about my dream and told him what Uncle Matt had said, and I told him I didn't understand about the eating at this one lady's house, but, you know, I told him that too. I remember him just being quiet over the phone and then just saying, wow. Being curious, I asked him about the eating dinner part, and he told me that when they did go hunting, they would go to Uncle Matt's friend's house who lived near the area where they were hunting and would eat dinner there that this elderly woman fixed for them. That year, my dad took one last hunting trip. I'd like to think that Uncle Matt went on it with him. I've had so many experiences, including seeing a spirit in an abandoned building, talking to a spirit in a storm drain tunnel, and so on. I will write you those later. Anyway, hope you ladies creep it real and stay safe from COVID and don't get scared. Megan. Megan, you can keep that creepy ass bitch that held your hands down. Mm-mm. What in the avatar is going on here? A uh, wannabe fucking incubus avatar. I mean. That did not sound pleasant. I mean, it didn't sound pleasant because it was a creepy, unwanted thing, but... You better asterisk your request for an incubus. Right? Mm -mm. Beard, tattoos, on face would be pleasant. And, (laughs) I mean... This girl's got a fetish all of a sudden. I do, y'all. If you have face tattoos, hit a girl up. All of a sudden, I don't know what... I don't know, but... TikTok got this girl lit. For real. Like, in the past month, it's been like, what did I do? I don't know. It's with the face tattoo. <laughs> <laughs> you sounded like Yogi Bear. That was great. Well, so did you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Hey y'all, your podcast makes my long drives every day worthwhile. Your humor is much appreciated. I have several stories, but the experiences that have stuck with me the most is the land we had that was most definitely haunted. I've been told that I'm an empath or a sensitive. I don't know. I just know that weird shit finds me. Always. I have dreams about things before they happen, and I can almost always know who's calling me before my phone even rings. So, who knows? 
buckle up, get some wine, and hang on because this is going to be a long one. These events took place over 10 years. My ex-husband and I bought some land a year after we got married in 2008, and I was expecting our first child. It wasn't far outside of Savannah, Georgia, in a rural area. It was a mostly vacant lot, but still had an old barn and large fields that hadn't been cleared. It was a little over eight acres. We built our home and moved in about a month before our son was born. My ex turned the barn into a shop, he was a mechanic, and with several renovations had it up and going. He spent most of his time out there and I would often have to go out there to bring him dinner or talk to him about something and it always creeped me out, especially at night. I constantly felt like I was being watched and the yard of the barn could be like 60 degrees in the dead of summer when it was 100 degrees out. Whatever was out there was a menacing feeling. Definitely not something I ever wanted to find out about. My ex was a non-believer and very skeptical, so he acted like it didn't bother him for a while. The first experience I had, other than just a bad feeling about the barn, was a scratching noise outside the house. It would be a bang, then a scratch, down the side of the house, and it would go all the way around and bang, and scratch again. This would happen three times and just stop. This became a sort of regular thing every couple of weeks, and my ex did hear it, even though he blew it off his pipes and the house settling. Okay, Bocephus, whatever makes you sleep better. When my son was two, he still wasn't talking but a couple of words, but he would sing. He has Asperger's, so he had delayed speech, but he would sing very well, too. He started singing this song that sounded almost an old slave song. And when I asked him what he was singing, he sang it again. And I was like, where did you hear that, baby? And he pointed out to the window towards a field and said, man, man sing. I looked out there and there was no one. I asked him to repeat it. And he sang something about getting whooped on a hill, hung by his head and died. This freaked me out, and I wrote down the words he was singing, best I could make out, and gave it a goog. The first thing that came up was, they never said a mumbling word. So after this, I started asking around to the neighbors whose family owned the land there for many generations, and was told that General Sherman had followed the route our land was on, and there had been an old plantation there, and it was burned. It was definitely interesting to find out. The noises continued and the creepy barnyard stayed creepy. And one day I was changing my son's diaper and I heard a loud pop and grabbed him to go check things out. And every single cabinet door as well as appliances were standing open. We went to my mom's till my ex got home. When my son was three, we woke up at 3 a.m., to smelling smoke and hearing the microwave on to find my son in the kitchen. It was like he was sleepwalking and had put some paper in the microwave and turned it on for like an hour and it was on fire. We snatched it out of the wall and threw it out the back door and my son had woke up, came out of whatever he was in, and was crying and we asked him what in the world he was doing and he kept saying it wasn't him, it was Jacob. Who the fuck is Jacob? He would never tell us. My ex was finally on board and couldn't explain all this away. So fast forward a few years and my son was five and we had a daughter by then as well. We used to always threaten to give their toys away to the homeless kids if they didn't take care of them until one day when my son popped off with, you mean the ones that live in the field? Say what? What? Both kids were adamant there were two little girls and a little boy that lived in the field that had torn up clothes. They would play hide and seek with them, but they could never find them when it was their turn to hide. After I found this out, I reached out to my pastor and he did a blessing on the home and we never experienced anything inside again. But the land was still very active, especially in the barn and barnyard. 
I decided that was enough and I was going to contact a paranormal team to come in and maybe they could make this go away, but never had any luck. One was going to come out, but flaked on us last minute. I started to do research on my own, only to find out that not only had the plantation been burned there, a home that was rebuilt many years later had burned to the ground in the 70s, and the family of five didn't make it out. When investigated, the fire was found to have started in one of the bedrooms, the one that belonged to their son, Jacob. I finally found a team that came out and did an investigation, and the team included a medium. What she told us floored me. There were nine spirits there total. The family of five, three people who died there as slaves, who were all, quote, good spirits, and a dark spirit that was supposed to be that of an overseer who had died on the plantation and said to be extremely cruel to the slaves. But then she got very frantic and said, there is something else here, something demonic, and it's strong. They did EVPs in the barnyard, and a deep, scary voice was recorded naming my entire family and saying, they belong to me. And the medium was scratched. I guess now is a good time to insert a side note that over the years, my ex and my relationship had deteriorated pretty quickly and his health declined rapidly. However, when we were away from the home, we got along pretty well and he felt better. The medium said these things could have been attributed to the demonic force there. I decided right then and there I was getting out of there, but my ex refused to leave. About two years later, the marriage ended and myself and the children moved across town and he ended up losing the house to the bank as he couldn't afford it without my income too. He moved to another place in town and his health has greatly improved and his personality is so much like it was when we met. The difference in him is astonishing. The events from what took place in our marriage definitely couldn't be reconciled. But it honestly makes me wonder sometimes if it was him or the influence of the, quote, demon that was supposed to be there. Either way, our family made it out of there and we haven't had any other experiences since. The family that bought the home from the bank moved out in less than a year and it's been sitting for three years empty now. Keep creeping on, ladies. Kim from Georgia. Well, I got one thing to say. Well, it's definitely not one word. It's just one thing. But the ghost bros need to go check that out. They in Georgia. Mm-hmm. She's in Georgia. Well, she don't own it anymore. Well, it's still. She can tell them the address. And um, it sounds like, I mean, I could be wrong, but it sounds like she's single and they might could be popping her trunk. Exactly. And I mean, you want that. Mm-hmm. Have you seen them? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're not all single, so you're going to have to be careful. Mm-hmm. You can only have a select few. Two. Two of the three. Marcus is the only married one, right? Yeah, I think so. Juwan and Darren aren't married. Juwan's arms, though. I mean, whew. Darren's style, though. Darren's leadership, though. But Marcus is my boo. But he taken, so. But he taken. Of course, of course, of course. Do y'all see? I got 99 problems, and y'all see them all. Trust me, y'all, I see them all. <laughs> I swear, when you said, like, when you were talking about how he hung out, like, that could have been a fucking movie. Yeah, A Haunting in Georgia. When you said that he hung out, like, all the time in the barn, Mm -hmm. like, you had to take his food out and everything, I was like, oh, there's something out there. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, shit, he about to start changing. Uh Uh-huh. I was right. Uh Uh-huh. Foreshadowed that foreskin. Yup. Well, I'm glad y'all are out and y'all are safe and everybody's doing better. All right, last one. Hey there, Carrie and Donna. Florida girl here. Love the podcast and love your accents. I love paranormal stuff, and I have two small stories for you. When I was about 14, my mom, stepdad, sister, and I all lived in my grandma's house. My sister is 10 years apart from me, but we had to share a room, so she was about five at the time. We are all Christians in my family, and along with that, we obviously believe in demons and bad spirits. For a long time, I remember hearing whispering at night while I was in my room. It wasn't my mom or dad because their room was super far away, and the only time you could hear them is if they were really loud. 
It wasn't my grandma because she always goes to bed early and she was always alone. It sounded like a man and a woman and it was loud enough for me to hear it, but the words weren't clear enough to make out. This went on for months and then stopped suddenly. About a week ago, I was telling this story to my family and I'm now 26 and my sister is 16 and she suddenly interrupted me saying that she remembered it. At five years old, she clearly remembers hearing the whispering. Totally freaked me out and convinced me I wasn't crazy. My second story happened about a year or two ago. Our family friend had given me a box of crystals, which I loved, but within the box came a statue of the Hindu god Ganesh. Being Christian and having a statue of a different deity kind of made me feel uneasy. Just the statue itself gave me a bad feeling as well. It being a gift, I didn't want to throw it away, so I tried to put it on my shelf on display, but this made me feel uneasy, so I put it up in my closet. I figured, out of sight, out of mind. Boy, was I wrong. One night, I was having trouble sleeping, and it had only been an hour or so I had been laying down, and all of a sudden, clear as day, I felt something grab my leg. It was such a clear physical feeling that I actually jumped and sat up in bed. I was so terrified. Luckily, no other instances happened that night, but it definitely did not help my sleep situation. I called my mom and told her I felt something grab me and I was scared. She, out of the blue, just nonchalantly says, you know that statue that was given to you along with the crystals? Well, I got one too and it made me uncomfortable and I threw it out. You could do the same if you feel that would make you feel better. The thing that was freaky was that I had not even told her or mentioned about the statue. It was never brought up in conversation, and for her to suddenly bring it up was definitely a sign to throw it out. I threw out the statue, and it never happened again. Sorry if these were lame stories, but just thought they might interest y'all. Keep on creeping on. Y'all are the best. Florida girl, Kaylee. I don't think it was the statue that made that. I mean, unless, I mean, I guess somebody could put ill will literally on anything but i mean that's a i mean albeit a different religious artifact than your religion it's still a religious artifact of for someone else you know what i mean i mean again you can put ill will on any artifact but i don't know what do you think no i agree i agree also depending on what the crystals were like i feel like if it was something with the statue it the crystals would have protected you you know like most crystals are like with protection and Things like that, so... But the deity Ganesh is about new beginnings and empowering and all of that. So, like, what it stands for is protection and empowering. You know what I mean? So that's why, I don't know. I don't know if it came from the from the statue, you know? But if you were more on alert because you thought it was a statue or whatever... Or you were uncomfortable, which is, which is totally fair. I mean, I yeah. can... Yeah, for sure. And I feel like then that's more like you're more susceptible to paranormal and everything like that. And that is super scary. I never want to feel someone grab my leg. Hell no. That's why you don't sleep with your leg out of the cover. Well, no. But she might not have had her leg out of the cover. True. And I do sleep with my leg out of the cover. I'm going to be honest. But that's why you don't leave it over the bed. Mm Mm-hmm. Because you got to have, sometimes you got to have that one foot out because it gets hot. (laughs) <laughs> I norm- You know what? I normally don't, but I have the fan on high. You also sleep in underwear. Thank you, Grandma. Who calls it underwear? <laughs> what do you call it? Panties. Nobody says panties. Paul, what okay. do y'all say? Okay, so if a guy's like, what are you wearing, underwear? If they say panties. Well, a guy wouldn't be wearing panties. I mean, if you want to, no kink shame. But, like, if... If I were to ask a guy what they're wearing, no, I'm saying if they ask you, what are you wearing? Are you wearing? Are you wearing your panties? No, they'd be like, what are you wearing? And then you answer, and my panties. <laughs> what do you say? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> you did. So what? I don't know. I feel like uh, underwear. <laughs> maybe I don't know. What do I say? Oh God. But yes, what do y'all say? Panties or underwear? Yes. I mean, I feel like... I got all my sexy underwear. I have my sexy panties. I mean, I'm just saying. My grandma would get me underwear for Christmas. Well, grandma got run over by a reindeer. Damn, some parties might have. Up north, I don't know. Might be a sad song for some people, I'm just saying. 
Well, if it is, send it in as a sinister <laughs> sighting. A paranormal chicks at gmail.com. Savage. And remember. And someone's got her underwear in a bunch. <laughs> <laughs> Creep it real and, and don't, don't get, get scared. scared. <laughs>